My talk was actually entitled Introduction of Genetic, Genetic Testing in Uveal Melanoma, but I think I'll just change it slightly to Application of Genetic Testing in Uveal Melanoma and add the perhaps question, is it still bench or are we already at the bedside? So I'm going to um, start um, at the beginning and uh, just go cover uh, some basics which include um, genes and DNA. So as you know, people develop from one single cell as a result of a fusion of a, an oocyte and a sperm and this then, from this one single cell, we all develop into creatures of varying <laughs> sizes and uh, muscular strengths. And this uh, essentially what determines our, how we look and often how we feel and our emotions and psychology is all dependent very much on our DNA which uh, defines and forms our cells. So DNA, as you all know, is packaged into chromosomes and each of us have copies from our parents, both sides of our parents and, uh, and, uh, and essentially we have 23 chromosomes. And DNA is a, a code, a digital code, consisting, consisting of uh, what are called base pairs or nucleotides. And the human genome contains three billion nucleotides, which essentially fills four to five hundred page encyclopedias. And here you have essentially the content of one single human genome. So you've probably all heard of the Human Genome Project, which was a very large and actually expensive project, and in typical American fashion involved a, a race between uh, the private sector and the public, and uh, it cost a lot of money, one billion, but it produced uh, a base reference genome, uh, which was pooled from 50 individuals. And then Craig Ventura, who is seen here on the left, was actually the first person to have his own genome sequenced. So from this, we realized that um, we uh, all have approximately 20 to 25,000 genes, but only 1.5% of that is responsible for, uh, is coded and creates what we are. And the important parts of the genome are what are called exons. So it was essentially it, through this human genome project, it was we could demonstrate that each of us have unique DNA sequences, and we, the uh, the individuality or the variation is caused by what things call single nucleotide polymorphisms and structural variants. So by 2010, eight people have since had their genome sequenced. It's the aim of the NIH that um, this should be offered to all individuals at some stage and that the cost be reduced to $1,000. The, the area of D DNA sequencing, this is a, a booming industry. There are a variety of different techniques used and it is realistic that this could actually be possible. So why sequence genomes? Well, essentially to understand biological processes, how we vary, how we differ from other species, how we differ across the planet, and particularly in, with relevance to this conference, cancer development, and how we can improve uh, health and healthcare and um, as you all know, this is these buzzwords, personalized medicine or stratified medicine. So just, I'm not going to go into great detail about this, but the Human Genome Project involved pretty much uh, what's called conventional sequencing, Sanger sequencing, which was de developed by Frederick uh, uh, Sanger, who's in Cambridge. Um, and it took a huge amount of time, a huge amount of money. This, there's a whole array of techniques which can be subsumed under the title Next Generation Sequencing using different, uh, different platforms. And this 
produces masses and masses and masses of amount of data in a shorter time period. And um, I think this, this is where we're leading to in terms of trying to understand cancer and how we can personalize cancer medicine. So with that introduction, then we move on to molecular genetics and cancer. How, um, it, as I said before, our human genome can essentially be filled in all these different four to 500 page encyclopedias. What happens in cancer is that um, you have what are called somatic mutations. These differ from what are called germline mutations, which you, some patients are born with. So uh, these somatic mutations occur during life as a result of various environmental influences in some cases, or as a result of um, aberrations in the cell cycle process. So when we're doing genetic testing in cancer, we can apply it in four different ways. We can apply it to understand how tumours develop, to understand what are these somatic mutations occurring in the tumour cells, with what frequency and at what stage of tumour development. We can use the genetic testing to actually confirm a diagnosis. And there are particular cancer types where you, <coughs> this genetic testing is routine to, to confirm a particular type of lymphoma or leukaemia from another type and this is important for the subsequent therapy. You can use genetic testing for therapy response, which I'll come on to, and the final point in terms of prognostication. So these two, prediction of therapy response and prognostication is pretty much this personalized medicine. So looking at uveal melanoma, so this is a flat mount, you can't see it very well here, but this is a flat mount of a normal choroid, and these are melanocytes. And our understanding, the hypothesis, is that you have a melanoblast, possibly in the choroid, which transforms, matures into melanocyte, possibly goes on to uh, become a nevus, so a, a benign proliferation of melanocytes. And then there is a malignant transformation whereby the, uh, the nevus cells go on to a melanoma. It ha could be, however, that we have a malignant transformation occurring in the melanocyte and it skips the nevus phase and goes straight to the melanoma. And then we have progression whereby the tumor cells leave the eye and spread to, to the liver. So there are, <coughs> in, uh, probably along this whole pathway, there are mutation amplifications of oncogenes occurring, deletions of so-called tumor suppressor genes, epigenetic alterations, these are alterations above the level of the DNA, and then chromosome aberrations whereby you get sweeping and swapping of arms of chromosomes, and uh, this results in alterations in the tumor cells. And this ultimately all then relates into dysregulation of the cell cycle, and also an inability of the cell to die as it should die according to apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So this is a complicated slide, but essentially is a summary of all the amount of work which has gone on at the basic level in trying to understand how, how uveal melanomas develop. And I just want to highlight some. Um, it was mentioned this, mo this morning, Catherine, that uh, the, this, uh, the frequency of so-called GNAP mutations and GNA11 mutations which occurs in nevi, but also in uveal melanoma, and more commonly in uveal melanoma compared to, for example, skin melanoma. And also the BAP mutations, and it this, the frequency of the BAP1 mutations varies considerably according to the studies that you, you look at in the different groups. It's important to note that BAP1 mutations also occur in other tumours that are not specific for uveal melanomas. They also occur, for example, in mesotheliomas. So when we're looking at how can we translate this to the, to the bedside? Well, we, it's still pretty much um, an, at the embryonic phase. So we can use um, detecting GNAC1, uh, GNAC and G, GNA11 and somatic BAP mutations in circulating tumour cells. And there's some very preliminary data from various, a number of groups which have demonstrated there are circulating tumour cells in patients with high-risk uveal melanomas and also with metastatic uveal melanomas. 
and then you can demonstrate that they are melanoma cells on the basis of various things, including the GNAC11 mutations. There are some families who have uh, who are at increased risk of developing UV melanomas, and have some groups which are listed here have demonstrated that you can determine the presence or absence of BAP1 mutations in their bloodstream for the and to estimate their risk in developing UV melanoma. So. Another area that I'll come on to later in more detail are the chromosomal aberrations in uvular melanoma. And um, these are summarized here. You all know of the partial or complete loss of chromosome 3, the gains in chromosome 8q, which is the long arm of chromosome 8, and the amplifications of 6, which are, um, I'll come on to later, are, seem to have a protective effect. Who actually described these alterations first is a bit of debate, <laughs> whether it was Sheffield, whether it was Vancouver. Val White and her group described it uh, in 1990. I think it was perhaps a month dis difference. What was important, however, I think a landmark paper, whoops, was, and I'll come on to later, is the paper of Gabriella Pressure from Essen, who demonstrated that the loss of chromosome 3 has prognostic implications. Important also to note that all three were women. So, <laughs> so what is the role of molecular testing in uveal melanoma, in diagnosing uveal melanoma? Well, I think, uh, without wanting to irritate clinicians here, most clinicians, <laughs> most clinicians believe they look into the fundus, they see that something that smells like a duck, looks like a duck, it is a duck. It is therefore a melanoma. However, there are um, cases we all know where the, it is unclear uh, or the patient has had a uvular melanoma and the, it has been missed or that the tumour actually is it's difficult to determine whether the tumour is a uvular melanoma or is it metastatic disease. And uh, in, in Liverpool, in such a a case, an intraocular biopsy would be performed. Let's move on. Um, and tumour material would be taken that would be examined cytologically, stained using immunohistochemistry. And in this case, we could demonstrate that this was a, a breast carcinoma metastasis with estrogen positivity. We can also look at the HER2, HER2 status. If it was an example of a metastatic lung carcinoma, we can also look at the EGFR status which is important for determining particular chemotherapy. In the case of the melanoma, we confirm that it's melanoma not only on the basis of the morphology but also in immunohistochemistry and then we extract the DNA from that material and do the molecular prognostication. But I'll come back to that. In exceptionally rare cases you can have an infiltration of tumour cells into the eye as it occurred in this patient who had skin melanoma 10 years previously, unfortunately had an UV melanoma in one eye, had an infiltration in the other eye. What are these tumour cells? We <coughs> extract the DNA from these. We look at the BRAF mutations, which more commonly occur in the cutaneous melanoma. We look at the GNAC, GNAC and the GNA11 mutations, and the results come back. There are the BRAF mutations present. GNA11 and GNAC uh, are normal. So it all speaks for a metastatic uh, cutaneous melanoma. Exceptionally rare, however, um, in some cases it's necessary to do this differentiation. So in prediction of therapy response, we're not at the stage as uh, in some tumours where we do, color, for example, a colorectal carcinoma, where they do gene expression profiling and they can determine who's going to respond to a type of therapy and who's not. We're also not at the stage of, uh, in the, with cutaneous melanomas, where you look for particular mutations of the tumour cells and see whether you can apply a particular magic bullet, as in the, the BRAF mutations described in uh, cutaneous melanoma. Important to note that it was 10 years ago that this was first described. It took 15 million pounds. They used conventional Sanger sequencing for 10 genes only, and it took 18 months. It then took, a, and this was all done in the UK, then took a further 10 years for the Americans to get through all the, the bureaucracy and setting up a clinical trial. 
and, um, and then initiating the, the trial, which has been published in New England Journal of Medicine by Keith Flaherty, and um, demonstrating that using this particular agent in these patients with this um, mutation, that there was a very good response. Unfortunately, they do often develop recurrences. Um, however, at least there's a proof of principle, and now uh, the aim is to look at various other molecules along the cell signaling pathway. So what can we do in nuvial melanoma? Well, we can look at F uh, NICE and FDA-approved drugs. We can do it singly using Petri dish and looking at the effect on cell apoptosis, on the effect of cell number when we apply these drugs. Or we can collaborate with pharmaceuticals and we can uh, develop what are called drug libraries and we uh, have high throughput screening of a numerous number of drugs and see what effect they have on the uh, melanoma cell lines. <coughs> Another approach is also then validating this using in vivo and in vitro models. And we're looking at the chick embryo model for metastatic UV melanoma. We have a PhD stu student starting on this. And um, work which um, my postdoc Sarah Lake is doing is using next generation sequencing in looking at whole, the whole exome and looking at metastatic UV melanomas and identifying a particular genetic signature and trying to identify using this massive, massive data that she gets from the, these investigations, using software which is designed to help interpret that, to come up with signaling pathways and how we can find druggable targets along these pathways. <coughs> so this leads to molecular testing for prognostication. I'm really, I think I'm running out of time. The landmark paper by Grant, uh, Gabriella Pressure. This was then translated immediately, or not immediately, a couple of years later, Liverpool Ocular Oncology Centre using FISH. Uh, this was performed on patients who had enucleations or local resections. An audit was carried out in 2006 and demonstrated that essentially using FISH only, that uh, there were patients who, uh, who had on the FISH result, disomy 3, however developed unfortunately uh, metastases. So we went on and, uh, with the help of Fight for Sight, as you heard, uh, looked at a, a new technique, which is PCR-based, whereby you can test 31 loci of chrom over chromosomes 1, 3, 6, and 8 in a simultaneous reaction. Um, and you can uh, look at the status of these tumor cells and, um, and um, determine whether the patient is high or low risk. We did this initially on uh, frozen research data, validated the technique, moved on then to implementing it in, uh, in, the, in the NHS scenario. <coughs> and we've since now examined 874 patients using this technique. It is, uh, the advantages of this technique is it can be applied on fresh and formal and fixed materials. So paraffin blocks of tumours can be sent to us, we extract the DNA and we perform this in our accredited molecular pathology laboratory using all the required controls. The information is, isn't just given out of black and white in terms of monosomy 3 uh, or disomy 3. Or we incorporate uh, this, we being Professor D'Amato and the biostatisticians incorporate all the clinical data with the histomorphological data and the genetic data and produce the, um, an individualized prognostic curve for each of the patients. This is then used for counseling in, in each individual case. So this, has, this prognostication model has been developed on the basis of a large data bank um, in collaboration with the biostatisticians with a, a test set and then a validation set. And we do this prognostication testing not only on the enucleation specimens, the endoresections or the local resections, but also on these intraocular biopsies. For this, we have a specialized biomedical scientist who knows how to process these samples. If we have, large, if we have sufficient DNA, we do the MLPA. If we have smaller quantities, we use another technique called microsatellite analysis, which we've um, uh, developed in our laboratory in the last couple of years. So when we look at a prognostication of melanoma, it's a controversial field. Everybody comes up with a different techniques, 
everybody says they're better than the others, and there is a lot of kindergarten sort of fighting going on. I must say a bit of bullying as well. The thing is, I think the most important thing is that this testing is done in a, uh, an accredited laboratory with experience and um, incorporated with all the other data. And this field is progressing so quickly that I believe in two years we'll be talking about different techniques and indeed we're collaborating with Professor Graham Black in Manchester to move on to a different test which will be have similar price as MLPA which is only approximately 200-250 pounds um, in contrast to the gene expression profiling which is a good 2000. So, But I just feel that, the, that this is a rapidly developing field and that we should um, move with it. Um, we continually do quality assessment. We're always comparing uh, fish, uh, the MLPA with fish, array CGH, also uh, with microsatellite analysis. We have external controls as well, whereby we send away samples to Essen in Germany and we compare our results on 10 or 20 samples. We're doing the same with Philadelphia, which should be up there. And we're also doing a, an analysis of the gene expression profiling with MLPA. So when we come back to the original question, is molecular testing still at the bench or have we moved to the bedside? I think when we look at the four different areas where molecular testing is applied, okay, with respect to the pathogenesis, large volume of material, but we haven't really moved that all to the bedside, possibly only with the circulating tumour cells. Diagnosis confirmation in rare cases. Prediction of therapy responses is an area we really have to work on. And I think prognostication in, I think, most centres has moved from the bench and is at the bedside. This is our website, uh, which has uh, information for clinicians in terms of how samples could be sent. And I receive also lymphoma samples, intraocular lymphoma samples. Um, so how they could be sent um, and also information for patients. And this is the prognostication uh, model, which is available online. This is the, the research team, Sarah Lake, who I mentioned before, Dr. Helen Callaray, who's very much involved in producing a large biobank, and we're very fortunate having collaboration with the liver surgeons um, who send us material, also collecting blood. Martina Angie, who's looking at the circulating tumour cells, also the uh, proteomics, and Andy Dodson, who's looking at the metastases. Um, we've been sponsored by several groups, including Fight for Sight, Cancer Research UK, Northwest Cancer, and Sarah was recently given the award at CIUK Postdoc of the Year. And here they are, no. fighting the cause, and this is a poster put up in the CIUK Centre down in London. We're quite an active group, and, uh, and we're uh, often going out either walking or running. I did a run for CIUK, also for Fight for Side, be willing to do one for Ocuma. and. Uh, with that, I'd like you to take the pamphlet home and put uh, the date of February 5th in your calendars for next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>